Welcome to our second episode of Dogs Who Sail TV. Today I am joined by Assistance Dogs Australia team leader Ken Innes. Ken has over 20 years dog training experience with both working dogs and family pets. In this interview, Ken shares with us tips on training our dogs to go to the toilet on the boat. I specifically reached out to Assistance Dogs Australia because of our unique situation and they also train dogs to toilet in many different circumstances. Unfortunately, there is no magic solution and every dog has his or her own personality, but it is helpful to tap into the knowledge and experience of the professionals who can provide us with either new information or validate actions that we've already taken. I really hope you enjoy the episode so let's get into it and hear what Ken has to say. Hey now, take a step outside and seize the day now. Set aside your worries, it's okay hey now. The sun is here to stay. Blue. dog trainer for Assistance Dogs Australia. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Thanks. Hi from New South Wales. <laughs> great, great. Well, you're going to have viewers from all over the world. Our Dogs, dogs Who Sell community is, um, yeah, people with their dogs sailing everywhere. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to them all. <laughs> <laughs> So today we're going to be following up from episode one. Uh, Ken's going to, to offer a bit of insight into um, toilet training. But first we'll just start off, Ken, um, I'd love for you to share a bit about um, what Assistance Dogs Australia do and, and your role, who you are. Sure, no worries. So I work uh, as Ken said, uh, Assistance Dogs Australia. Uh, we train dogs for people with disabilities. Uh, our four main career paths for dogs is people with mobility problems, uh, people with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, families living with autism and education support dogs. So those four different roles support quite a variation in dog types that we need. Um, so a dog that may be suitable for one program may not be suitable for another program and vice versa. Um, just to, to be on the topic of what we're talking about today, what all four of those have got in common is that we need good toileting behaviour out of the dogs. Um, dogs don't naturally know or understand what a human environment is, and these dogs are exposed to human environments in that they are expected to have good toileting behaviour in those environments. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably the main reason that I contacted <laughs> you guys because you you do have such unique environments as we do with toileting our dogs on boats. So, um, yeah, I think I've, I've tapped into a great resource here. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you'd just like to, to, yeah, let everybody know as well a bit about your background. I know we just chatted about it, but as I said, I'm going to make you. Sure. You. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, um, despite my youthful appearance, I've been training dogs for over 20 years, uh, mostly in the, the sector four um working dogs of some description so for the last four years i've been with assistance dogs australia uh, being the team leader so training the trainers how to train dogs 
uh, training the dogs and then uh, taking all the credit at the end when we uh, put the dogs with the with the clients and doing training with them as well. So uh, they say never work with children or animals. I managed to do both uh, and it throws up its own set of challenges, obviously. But yeah, it's good fun. So prior to that, I was working um, not exclusively, but mostly with different detector dog agencies, uh, both here and overseas. So training dogs for uh, mail centres, airports, um, and all sorts of different natural environments as well, uh, to detect different odours, um, as well as what every, or most dog trainers are done, which is the, the standard commercial, helping people with behavioural problems with their pets. Right. So, um, yeah, it's not bad. I get paid to play with dogs all day and to help people. So it's a win-win. Fantastic. Love it. Love it. Um, so before we jump in as well, I'm just going to explain to, to our viewers that we're, you and I are just having a chat today and yes, we're tapping into to some of your experience and, and knowledge, um, but really at the end of the day, um, dogs are unique individuals and in, as we said before, in, in quite a unique situation on a boat. So. Um, training them to go to the toilet, you may get, you may have great success, but also, yeah, you may have some challenges as well and, and need to maybe invest in getting a professional trainer on board. But yeah, um, we don't have a, a magic solution, um, unless you, you do have one, <laughs> Ken. No, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm all out of them. I'd be rich if I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, if, if we can just bear that in mind, everyone, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, so we might just- And, and on that, the, the sad truth is not every dog will be suitable. Um, same as not every human likes sailing, not every animal's got to like sailing. So um, you can try to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. Um, most dogs will love being with their humans, no matter where their humans are. Uh, but if there's a welfare issue or something like that, then take the dog into consideration and come up with a plan B. Great plan, great. I, really good advice. Um, so if we just, um, yeah, maybe walk through a step-by-step -step guide is probably the easiest. So if you've got your dog and you're, you're about to go on your boat for the first time. Yep. So, if you want to <laughs> so the... the that'd be great. Oh. I will, so this is this would be a lovely textbook answer. Um, in other words, there might be steps that people will skip or they may not have time to do them all or their dog might naturally do a few things straight away and you'll be able to skip a few things. Um, but as it, general advice, take from, what we, uh, take from it what you will and then take it from there. Yeah. Um, so the training will first of all start on land. So if you've got a dog in the house, the younger the better, but you can do this with old dogs as well. Um, with the dog in the backyard, you'll probably find there's a few areas where the dog likes toileting regularly. They're probably the keys that you guys are gonna use to start this toilet training program. Yeah. Um, so step one, identify an area that your dog already goes to the toilet or enjoys going to the toilet. Uh, second thing I'd do is purchase or get a surface that you can use to train the dog on in your backyard that you can then transfer to your yacht. So it would be an absorbed, um, a, an absorbive kind of texture. Carpet can work, fake grass is even better. Mm. Uh, pet shops do make purpose-made um, little self-made puppy pads and things like that. Feel yeah. free to use them as well. Uh, obviously, it has to be durable enough to withstand weather and hygienic enough that you can wash it out and reuse it, etc. Mm -hmm. et Put that, let's call it fake grass for now. Put the fake grass in the area where your dog wants to go to the toilet. And then what I'd suggest doing, at least until you've got confidence that the dog is using it, is take your dog to that spot to go to the toilet on lead. The advantage of doing it on lead is you can then control where the dog is likely to go to the toilet. Um, keep the dog moving, same as a human, movement tends to get the whole uh, process happening through the digestion. So if the dog's just standing there, you're gonna have a long night, but if you can move the dog just backwards and forwards, um, then that's more likely to get the process flowing for the dog. Um, if or when the dog finally does go to the toilet, 
it's great to put a keyword or phrase with that, which the dog can then link with that uh, behavior. So for example, here at Assistance Dogs Australia, we use the word toilet, toilet, just because it's a unique sound. It's not something that the dog's gonna accidentally hear during everyday conversation. Mm. Um, and the effect this has on the dog long-term is the same as uh, you listening to a trickling tap. It, it makes you have the desire to go to the toilet yeah. because with the dogs, we've paired that specific noise to that specific body function. Uh, so we use that to our advantage as well. So just you, on that note, does it matter like the pitch of your voice or anything, or it's just having that key word? The, the pitch is important insofar as that everyone who's going to be using it can replicate it. Right. Okay. So, so it needs to be, you know, if there's a mum and dad on board and both of them are giving the dog toilet breaks, it needs to be in a similar tone so that the dog can recognise it. Okay. Dogs are in fact a lot better at recognising uh, tone and inflection than they are in articulation. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, vowels and consonants and words themselves can quite often get lost in a dog, but if you use your tone the same and same number of syllables, dogs can get that generic sound quite easily. So yeah, choose, choose a word because that's the easiest thing to remember, but try to make sure that you're using very similar tones or inflections uh, if there's more than one person that's um, looking after the dog. So no yodeling or anything, that's a bit too complicated. Oh, if they're both good yodelers, go for it. <laughs> if they sing like me, probably a very bad idea. <laughs> Um, so we've now got our area that smells like uh, puppy pee already. Yeah. We've got a word that we've linked with the behaviour, so then the dog feels the desire to go. Um, and we've done enough repetitions, hopefully, that we can now move that area to somewhere else and still get a very similar result with that. Um, when the dog does go to the toilet, by the way, gentle praise. You don't have to get too excited and interrupt the dog mid-flow. Obviously, humans don't like that, neither do dogs. Um, <laughs> so, good dog, yeah, da-da-da-da-da, is fine. You don't have to go over the top with that. Um, and then from there, once you've got that working consistently, that's when I'll try to move it to, the, to a new environment, such as a yacht, or in our case, it might be a toilet in pen or, or something like that. Right, and yeah. again, you're gonna to try to use a very similar process. A dog will be on lead. You try to replicate everything as close as possible when you're changing one huge thing, so that way the dog can make the jump easier. Sure. Um, a few myths. Uh, if you go to work or, you know, you're doing, you're busy doing yachty things and the dog goes to the toilet inside and you go and rouse on the dog, your dog will not associate that with toileting in the wrong area. Okay. They just don't have the ability to link behaviour and association for more than a couple of seconds let alone minutes or hours or things like that. So a common myth is people go to work, they've got a young puppy, they leave it in the house, they get home, the dog's gone to the toilet and then they, you know, rouse on the dog or hit the dog or rub the dog's nose in it or something like that. And um, eventually the dog goes outside. Well, true, but the dog's going outside despite what they did instead of because of what they did. Yeah, right. If, yeah, so if you come into the yacht and you found that the dogs had a um, toileting issue inside the yacht, grab a newspaper, roll it up and hit yourself over the head with it. Um, because, <laughs> because it's you as the owner's fault for not giving the dog, um, you know, not monitoring the dog's routine, not realising, okay, my dog woke up half an hour ago or it got fed that long ago or it just had a big drink of water. I need to give the dog a toilet break. So uh, this comes down to one of your later questions. Um, but it's quite common for people to rouse on dogs or to, you know, um, rub their nose in it or hit dogs with rolled up newspaper mm. in the belief that it's going to stop the behaviour. When in actual fact, the most it does is teach dogs not to go to the toilet while humans watching them, which is yeah. the last thing you want to achieve. <laughs> Okay, that's really interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, if the dog does go to the loo and they will generally try to pick an absorbent surface, so carpets or things like that, um, clean it up as best as you can so you're not leaving any residual odour. Uh, don't use any cleaning products that have got ammonia in it because that can smell like urine to a dog. 
um, and then obviously go back to your basics of trying to get the dog onto the onto the fake grass. Yeah, yeah, great. Wow. Well, that's and that's that's the steps. That's the basic steps to getting your dog toilet trained. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, that that's great. Um, I think I'm just listening to you, and with with our cocker spaniels, Maxi and Mel, I think I I ticked all of those boxes except when it came to you know when they did go on the boat we were quite lucky but i would oh yeah i'd make such a fuss about it and <laughs> which isn't uh, if that's the only mistake you're making you're doing fantastic <laughs> <laughs> right. so i guess leading on from there um how much time so so we've done the training at home and then we're coming to the boat how much time is it a daily thing should we devote to training the dog? So the um, rather than hours invested, it's more about being smart with your schedule. Now, what I mean by that is uh, your Cocker Spaniels are going to be different to our Labradors and one of my Labradors is going to be different to another Labrador. One might, you know, do three poos a day. The other one might do one poo a day, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So if you feed the dogs at the same time every day and they get roughly, their routine is similar, it's easier to predict their toilet in behaviour. Yeah. So what you want to do is every time, whether that's once a day or five times a day, every time you predict that that dog might need a toilet break, that is when you do your toilet training. So you're not allocating... Uh, minutes, hours or whatever to the amount of time because there's only so many times a dog can go to the toilet. That's so you're basing your training around that rather yeah. than the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found with Max and Mel, we'd, I don't know, we kind of got into morning, as soon as they, uh, as soon as we got up, we'd go up to the fake grass, midday, go up to the fake grass and this, and then over an evening as well, probably early evening and then before bed. So we had that routine, um, which was pretty Perfect. Much, yeah, and, and we just stuck to it and thankfully. Yeah, and um, everyone, every dog's gonna be different with their um, body language. Yeah. Uh, I encourage everyone to look not just for obvious signs, but for subtle signs that their dog might need to go to the toilet and that way they're less likely to get caught out. So with, um, with, with your two, you know, you go, yep, okay, well, I'm pretty confident that I, they go this time, this time, and this time. Mm -hmm. But if you saw one of them scratching at the door or, you know, whining or something like that, you might think, okay, now would be a good time to see if the dog needs another toilet break. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can look for more subtle signs. The dog might be paying more attention to you or pacing up and down or panting more even could be a sign. So mm -hmm. just look for anything that's out of the ordinary and maybe that's also a good time to offer the dog a toilet break until you're confident that the dog's got a good routine. Yeah, great, great, I love it. Um, so look, this is maybe a question, how long is a piece of string, but how long <laughs> does it take to toilet train a dog? The, the younger, the easier. Uh, generally, puppies will start training when they're fully mobile. So that's when they can leave their whelping box or nest and then they can go and do their business in a hygienic area. So that's going to happen. They, you know, their, their eyes, ears, mouth open, they start getting coordinated. Give or take about six weeks of age depending on breed, etc., etc., And you can get results pretty much straight away. And you'll get some people that say, oh, I've never had a problem with my dog toilet training. And others that are five years old and say, my dog still has accidents. Um, so the length of the time is a how long's a piece of string. And it can literally go from days to years. Uh, but the, the best I could say is the earlier you do it and the more consistent you are, the, the shorter the time period you can expect. Um, older dogs, you've got to be a little bit more care careful of the medical side of it. Mm -hmm. So you might have dogs with um, weak bladders. Um, if they've had a few litters, the, the female dogs might be more prone to leakage, etc., etc. And that's part of life and something, you know, that you may have to accept if you're um, living on board a yacht with a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And that was my question about old, older dogs, because I think a lot of, a lot of people um, have already got their dog and then they decide to get the boat later on. So, yep. And yeah. So we, very doable. They just got to be patient with it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and 
that leads on to my next question. Like what is required um, from the owner that is going to help with toilet training? Patience and understanding. <laughs> so as we mentioned earlier, don't punish the dog's mistakes. It is a very foreign environment um, to be even in a house, let alone, you know, on, on a yacht. So uh, you have to make allowances for the dog to make it fun for the dog as well as for, for you guys as well. Um, equipment wise, you don't need much past, you know, a, a dog lead and obviously fake turf. Uh, do feel free to go around on Google or um, Tanya might even do some hunting and put them on her website, find a few links to different products. Uh, we don't personally condone any particular brand or anything like that. Uh, leave it up to you guys to search between or internationally, I guess, where you can yeah. find the, the best stuff. Um, that's about it equipment wise. And then from the, um, the owners, consistency. Um, so between mum and dad, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. No, I, that's fantastic. So I guess um, then we've got the dogs who just refuse to go on the toilet, uh, go to the toilet. So even some owners will say the dog, it used to go and then all of a sudden it stopped. And, and as we learned in, in the last episode, that could have been from a noise or the boat movement. We're on this unstable environment. Um, yeah, do you have any suggestions for, for those situations where the dog is just simply refusing to go? Um, if the dog used to go and it no longer does, the obvious thing to do is to try and identify what has changed. And it's either going to be medical or behavioural. It, it has to be one of those two. Yeah. Um, if you can't identify anything behaviourally, then it may be worth getting a vet check. Yeah. Behaviourally, it may be something that you're doing inadvertently. So remember before I said where if a dog's going to the toilet and you rouse on it for, or get angry at the dog for going to the toilet, because they've got a very short association period, the dog's going, okay, I've gone to the toilet, mum or dad's watching me, I've got into trouble for that, therefore I'm not allowed to go to the toilet while mum or dad is watching me. Mm -hmm. Not... I'm not allowed to go to the toilet in this environment. So something as simple as that, the thing is, why does the dog suddenly stop going to the toilet? And the dog's, you know, got its legs crossed and there's tears coming out its eyes. It's busting to go to it. saying, I'm not going to go while mum or dad's watching me. So it could be something behaviour like that. Yeah. Um, there's something called drive inhibition. So if you're scared of heights and on the edge of a cliff, you're less likely to be interested in eating a roast dinner. So one drive is going to take priority over another. Yeah. So if you've got a dog that's got uh, nausea, for example, um, so, you know, you say, yep, the dog's been fine at always toilets, and then you're in rough seas or the seas are at a different frequency, and you might notice the dog showing a few other signs as well. It could be that the dog's just feeling that sick that it may not need to go as well. Um, so, yeah, I encourage people just to explore and try and identify patterns where they're there and then take it from there as to which direction the solution takes them. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Um, well, we've covered a bit of ground here. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that there's some um, fantastic advice that, can is, yeah, you've really, um, yeah, you've really helped viewers today, I'm sure. Um, so maybe, yeah, we can end it there. Have you got anything else that you'd like to add or? Um, we are a non-for-profit charity. So um, I'm sure Tanya will put the link down there somewhere. Absolutely, uh, yes. The finger's in the right spot. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we're all, all donations are welcome, um, especially at the moment with COVID, a lot of where, you know, it's, it's harder to get the, the money coming in. Mm. Uh, we, we give our dogs free of charge to the clients. So all the funding we get comes from, from that support rather than from the clients. So, um, yeah, it helps us great. Um, other than that, I encourage you to, the, the more you know, the better result you're going to get with the dog. So by all means, um, you know, use uh, this as a resource, but also go online, read books, et cetera, et cetera, and listen to what other people have um, already experienced. Lovely, lovely. And yes, I'll certainly, I'll add some details below about Assistance Dogs Australia. And yes, um, Ken's donated his time today. So if we can support them, that'd be 
so lovely and yeah worthwhile so thank you ken um i'm so appreciative of your time today and yeah like i said i think this is going to be really helpful for a lot of dogs dogs who sail i hope so thanks tanya <laughs> thank you thank you great okay all right that's a wrap thanks for joining us today in australia we are seeing more and more dogs supporting human beings they truly are man and woman's best friends personally i couldn't have gone through my cancer diagnosis and the subsequent emotional roller coaster without my two dogs i've worked in ptsd units where i've met returned service men and women who now rely on their dogs for their survival every single day. They truly are a special gift. If you would like to know more about Assistance Dogs Australia or have a couple of dollars to donate to them, please refer to the link in the notes below. If you are in another country, you can research online assistance or support dogs to learn more about the organisations in your region. Until next time, my friends, fair winds and an abundance of doggy love.